baby was coming. And it couldn't possibly have been happening at a worse time. You see, the country was in turmoil. They had been invaded by a foreign army and the invaders were brutal. They had murdered thousands of people. They had thrown the economy into ruins. They were dragging exorbitant amounts of money and taxes out of the people. And even worse, some of their own people were turncoats and had sided with the enemy. We better find out more. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank you that we're, you are here with us this morning. We thank you that we can open your word and learn and read about the wonderful stories of old. And we just pray you bless our time with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are some things in life that we can see coming. And there are other things that happen totally unexpectedly, totally out of the blue. No warning at all. Let me give you an example. A month or so, two months ago, Marion and I hooked our caravan behind the car and headed off to Queensland to get away from Ballarat's freezing cold winter. Mind you, Queensland wasn't all that much better, but it was a bit. And so we're way up the top of Queensland, far north Queensland, and we're heading across from Cairns, we're heading across to Karanara on the Gulf of Carpentaria. And one night, we decided to pull into this little roadside free camping area. So we'd set ourselves up for the night and had dinner and went to bed in the caravan and got up the next morning to go on our way. And unbeknownst to us, at some time during the night, some sort of creepy crawly had worked its way into the car and worked its way and it was sitting up on top of the sun visor, just above the steering wheel. You know where this is going, don't you? Or at least you think you do. So next morning, Marion's barreling along the highway. Now, we've got a dirty big caravan. It weighs about three tons, a big heavy ute. And she's driving. And you've got to be careful, you know, when you're driving along with a big rig like that. So Marion's driving along. And that's when this thing decided to drop off the sun visor and land right on the back of her hand. She shrieked. I'm surprised you didn't hear it down here. <laughs> Forget about driving. She's now got two hands flapping wildly all over the place. And somewhere in all this hand flapping, the thing got hurled off her hand and chucked right across to my side of the car. I yelled at her. What did you do that for? Now it's gone up the leg of my shorts. Uh, well, now she's laughing hysterically. She can't see where she's going because of the tears in her eyes. She's still laughing. Oh, <laughs> boy. We survived. But there are some things that you can see when they're coming. When we were up there in Queensland, we were sitting in a big shopping centre in Townsville and we we're just having a coffee while she was having a soy chai latte and I was having a hot chocolate just near Kmart. And a woman came out of Kmart and she's got a great big massive trolley and she's shoving it along. And in the trolley, she's got a baby seat, she's got a bassinet, she's got a folding change table, she's got piles of nappies. And Marin just looked at me and she said, well, there's a baby coming into her life, isn't it? Obviously, preparations were being made. There was a baby on the way. Possibly a nursery might have been getting painted up and decorated for the baby. And over the dinner table, there would have been conversations. What are we going to name this child? And baby books would have been getting studied. Parents go to great lengths to prepare for the arrival of a baby. And God is no different. God just didn't wake up one morning and look down and say, oh, 
oh, things are in a real mess down there. I better send my son to go down and fix it all up. No, this was something that God had planned way before the earth was ever created. See, God knew that Adam and Eve would fail. He knew they would fall for the trap of Satan. And when God threw Adam and Eve out of the garden, he pronounced a sentence and a judgment on them. But he also pronounced judgment on the serpent. And to the serpent, he said, the seed, and that's an important word, the seed of the woman will crush your head and he and you will bruise his heel. And this was the very first cryptic clue that God gave about the coming of his son into the world. Now that word seed is interesting. It doesn't necessarily mean an immediate descendant, but like a seed that is buried in the ground, it can lie there dormant for a very long time. Now Eve, of course, didn't realize this. And whenever her firstborn son arrived, she naturally assumed that this was the seed that God had promised. This was the person who was going to restore the relationship with God. I just can't imagine how shattered her and Adam must have been when their beautiful, lovely firstborn son turned out to be a murderer and worse, to murder his own brother. But thousands of years would roll by. Nations and kingdoms would rise and fall. The Egyptian, Syrian, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. All these great kingdoms would rise and fall. And all the while, God was preparing for the coming of his son. And all the way, God kept feeding out little tidbits of information for those who were interested, for those who were watching, for those who were hoping. He called a man named Abraham. And he told Abraham that through his descendants, all of the world would be blessed. Moses told the Israelites that one day, God would raise up a servant just like him. And still later, he told King David that one of his sons would remain on the throne of Israel, son after son after son after son, all the way through until the Messiah came. And many of the hymns and the Psalms that King David wrote had to do with the life and ultimately the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And as time grew ever so closer to the time when the Messiah would come, more and more clues were given with one of the more powerful ones read to us by Ian this morning. God also told us that his son would be born to a virgin mother who had never slept with a man. He told us that his son would be born in Bethlehem. He told us that his son would be a direct descendant of King David. He said he would be a Nazarene. And eventually, of course, Jesus became known as Jesus of Nazareth. Then God threw in a curly one. He said, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Well, that would have thrown them. Because people would have had no idea that Mary and Joseph would flee to Egypt to get away from Herod the king who was trying to destroy their child. You know, usually when people left Israel and went down to Egypt, they never returned. But God had other plans for his son. And so Mary and Joseph eventually returned. But not to Bethlehem where he was born. They went and they lived in Nazareth. And that's how come Jesus came to be known as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, of course, there was one big question that every parent gets asked. When is the baby due? Well, God never answered that question directly. But he did tell Daniel exactly when the Messiah 
would be crucified. All the other clues and things that were told in the Bible were all open-ended. They could have happened in weeks, months, years, centuries in the future. But this prediction as to when Jesus would be crucified narrowed the whole time down, whole time frame down to the lifespan of one individual human being. Human being is what, 40, 50, 60 years. And by saying when Jesus would be crucified, it really narrowed down the time frame of when he would arrived. You probably heard of Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den. It's that Daniel that we're talking about. I'm just going to do a little detour because I love little detours. Whenever Daniel was a young teenager, maybe even a bit younger than that, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had invaded the land of Israel. And he took most of the people away captive to Babylon to work and to be slaves. And Daniel was one of those captives that was taken off. And he'd been in Babylon for a long, long time, taken away as a child. Now he was an old man. But he knew that God had told Jeremiah the prophet that they would only be captive in Babylon for 70 years. And now Daniel's old and he knew that the 70 years were nearly up. So he went and he prayed earnestly that God would forgive the sin and the rebellion of his people and let them go free, let them return to their own land. But there's no answer. No voice from heaven. Nothing. But 30 days later, something amazing happened. God's messenger angel, Gabriel, there's only two angels that we know the names of in the Bible. One's Gabriel, the messenger one, and the other is Michael, God's warrior angel. So Gabriel turns up and Daniel is terrified, as you could well imagine. And the very first thing, and this is important, that Gabriel said to Daniel, he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. And God has sent me to tell you what's in store for your people. And he told Daniel that in 483 years, the Messiah would be cut off. In other words, killed. And Gabriel pointed out to Daniel exactly when the beginning of that 483 years would commence. And from that starting point, it was exactly 483 years later that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey with the people throwing palm branches down on the road and laying their cloaks down on the road, cheering out, Hosanna to the son of David. And three days later, Jesus would be crucified. But that's getting a little bit ahead in the story, so let's just back up just a little bit. About 450 of the years had passed by, and all the while God's preparing the world for the birth of his son. And one day an old man was given the job of burning incense in the temple at the time of the evening sacrifice. So just imagine the picture. We've got the old man. He's in the temple. He's all on his own. It's just him. And there's this little golden table sort of thing, and he's putting the incense on it, and he's um, preparing to burn the incense. And outside the temple, there was a whole heap of people worshipping and praying, but they were on the outside. And the old guy's name was Zachariah. And his wife's name was Elizabeth. And they had a problem. They had no children. And that was a big problem. Because in a society that didn't have pensions, that didn't have welfare schemes, that didn't have Medicare, there was absolutely nothing. Whenever you were old, you relied on your children to look after you and support you and take care of you in your old age. 
and Zachariah and Elizabeth had no children. And for Elizabeth, it was even worse because it was an absolute disgrace in those days for a woman not to have any, not to bear any children for her husband. And for years and years and years, they had been praying for a child. But now they're old. And they had long since finished praying for the impossible. So here's Zechariah setting fire to the incense, the smoke's going up and whatever. And all of a sudden, guess who appears? Gabriel. The same angel that had appeared to Daniel all those years earlier. And the first thing Gabriel said to Zechariah was, don't be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. The time of waiting was over. God was taking action. And Gabriel said to Zechariah, you and Elizabeth are going to have a baby. Well, Zach was stumped. He said, that's crazy. Don't you know how old Elizabeth is? Don't you know how many times we tried to have a baby? Don't you know how old I am? Ridiculous. Impossible. I don't believe you. And Gabriel said, mate, you're not doubting me. You are doubting God. And from now on, you're not even going to be able to speak until the baby is born. Gabriel went on to tell Zechariah what his son would be like and what he would do. He told Zechariah that his son would go forth in the power and the spirit of Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of Israel's greatest prophets. He was the one that God gave the power to call down fire from heaven. God gave him the power to shut up the sky and stop it from raining and bring on droughts and famine. He was the one that was able to make it start raining again. And Gabriel was telling Zach that his son would be the one who would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. I know a lot of you were watching, um, what do you call it, The Chosen? A lot of you have been watching The Chosen. If you haven't, it doesn't matter. But have you ever wondered why Matthew, the hated tax collector, the Roman turncoat who turned against his people to serve the Romans, have you ever wondered why he would turn around and follow Jesus? Have you ever wondered why James and John would leave their father's fishing business and follow Jesus the moment that he called them? Have you ever wondered when Jesus went around the country preaching and teaching that all the people heard him gladly? That was the fruits of the work that John the Baptist had done in preparing the way. John's message was for people to repent of their sins and to show that they had repented by getting baptised. Now, all of that might have been very interesting, or it might have bored you to tears. But there are two takeaways that I want you to take home with you this morning. The first one is the words that Gabriel spoke to both Zechariah and to Daniel. Your prayers have been heard. God always hears the prayers of his people, so never Stop praying. The second one is why? Why did God go to all that trouble? Why did Jesus come? People think that Jesus came to make the world a better place. But that is not why Jesus came. Time and time again, he told the people why he came. On one instance, he said, I did not come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. In another place, he said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy, 
This is a faithful saying and worthy of being accepted, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is why he came. And nobody likes to think he's a sinner. We all like to think, well, I've lived a good life. I've tried to do the right thing. I've helped other people. Maybe I've done a couple of bad things, but the good that I've done is so much better than the bad. And so at the end of my days, God will let me into heaven. But that is not what the Bible says. If it was that simple, Jesus would never have had to come. All we would have to do was just live a good life and at the end of our days, we would get in, all the bad people would be locked out and we'd be happy ever after. The problem is we are all bad people. You are a sinner and I am a sinner. And we have to recognise that and acknowledge that we are sinners to God. We have to consciously and deliberately confess to him that I am a sinner and ask him for forgiveness. And whenever we do that, that is the moment that Jesus comes into our hearts and lives. That is the moment that we are born again. That is the moment that we become part of God's family. So in conclusion, there's just two things I want you to take home tonight, today. One, never ever stop praying especially for your kids for your children for your family for your grandkids and keep on praying even when all hope seems to be gone and it seems to be impossible because even if you don't think it your prayers are always heard and the second thing was this jesus did not come to make the world a better place jesus came to save sinners. He came to save you. Let's pray. Loving God and Father, just thank you so much for being with us this morning. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, to be our saviour, to be our redeemer, to bring us back into a right relationship with him. So we thank you for him this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.